Second Corinthians chapter 5, verses 10 through 15. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that ye may have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance, and not in heart. For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether it be sober, it is for your cause. For the love of Christ constrains us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. And back in verse 10, we may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad, reminds me of, of uh, I think it was a daughter of an official in the Salvation Army, and she, uh, she was very discouraged and praying to die. Christians do this sometimes. She got very discouraged, and she was asking the Lord to take her, and her mother appeared to her in vision. And she said, you have no idea how precious life is. You have no idea of the opportunity that you have to lay up treasures. And others that I have read uh, that of, of visions beyond the veil or so on, uh, this kind of thing, have said that every act of kindness, every act uh, where you have put others first and uh, have demonstrated that uh, you love God and fear God and you are not so willing to please yourself as you are to do what is right, lays up tremendous reward in the spirit realm. It lays up tremendous. We don't have any idea of how literally this is true because all of us each day, like today, you made decisions, I made decisions. We either decided to do what was right or we put, we made self number one and we acted out from that position. Or we said, no, it's more in the favor of other people that I act in a certain way. It's more to their good that I act in a certain way. Do you know what I mean? See, we have that decision constantly, whether we please ourselves or whether we live in a way that is more beneficial to other people. And that, you talk about heavenly citizenship, that is the core of it, is uh, pleasing yourself versus doing, and I'm not talking around, running around like Pollyanna. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about just the simple decisions that you don't go out looking for, but come to you. And you have a decision right then, either to please God and make things right around you, or to grab for yourself and do what it is you want. And that that is really where the essence of heaven is. You talk about heaven <coughs> and living in the paradise with God's people. That is what God is looking for, is that selflessness of character. And so when he says this, it's, it's very literally true that what we do is really, is really what you receive. It may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or evil. It should be evil, translated evil, not bad. That connotes something else. It should be good or evil. So we're all the time either doing good or we're doing evil. And when we do evil, we can pray and ask the Lord to help us and change us and repent, and then it will be blotted out and we won't receive it. But we already receive it here. Do you realize that? The evil that we do, we receive here, and the good that we do, we receive here. We're not talking about just something way out the future. The judgment seat of Christ operates already in our lives. And as we do good over a period of time, great good comes forth. And as we do evil over a period of time, pretty soon, if God's hand is on us, we begin to reap this right here. And once you go into the prison, you don't come out until you pay the last farthing. The sinner, 
the unsaved person may get in and do one day for ten, but not you. You will pay the last farthing if you uh, if if God's hand is on you, and and He has a place for you to walk in His courts. His judgment comes right down hard, so that we won't be condemned with the world. That's the purpose of it, because we're His children. Therefore, he chastens us. That's why he's so strict. Is What's out there with the devil's children is another matter. But what is true of God's children is very strict. And he keeps strict books on us. And we may get away with stuff for a while and God probes our conscience and does. But all of a sudden, boy, the axe falls. And when it does. And even then, even when... We have not been knowingly doing evil, but have been doing good. And the Lord sees parts of our personality that are still not the way he wants. He sends trouble on us. And I mean it's trouble. And it makes us pray. And we pray like mad. And, it, and of course, nobody likes trouble. And nobody likes to be living in dread and everything. But the effect of it is very good because it stirs up our nature and we find ourselves when we're driving, we're praying, when we're walking around, we're praying, everything we're doing, we're praying, praying, praying. And that's what God wants is to keep us interacting with him like that. And that's the purpose of it. And if when we're not under that kind of trouble, we get kind of careless and kind of loose in things. So God is glorified when we receive the desires of our heart. And he is glorified when we are looking up and saying, oh, thank you, Father, you have given me exactly what I wanted. You have just loaded me with benefits. And that's what God wants to hear. But because he has a higher value, which is our personality, he defers his own joy in hearing our gratitude and praise and, and watches us go through these terrible things and Christ watches with a kind of a dismay and God knows what he's doing, but everybody's sad about it, you know. It's like when you have to take your child and whop on him good. The house, house isn't rejoicing. And it's that way with us. And you need to realize that when you're going through it. That's not making heaven happy because you're not uh, jumping around like a little bird and twittering off your praises. And you're all bowed down with this weight on you. But it is necessary so that later you will render to God the praise and the glory that he wants. So this, this law... Uh, sowing and reaping, what you do in your body, can, is, is immutable. Somewhere you face the consequences of your deeds. Christ will take away the guilt of them. He eventually will take away... Uh, see, sin has a guilt, it has a compulsion, and it has an effect or a penalty. Sin has those three things. It has a guilt... It has a compulsion in us to cause the sin, and then it has an effect of sin. And the effect can be terrible. It can even be physical death. It can be any kind of thing. And Christ came to do away with all three, the guilt, the compulsion, and to heal us from the effect. But let me tell you something. This does not happen overnight. It's a long, torturous kind of process that requires patience and faith as God works and probes and digs and prunes and cuts and everything. He, he took care of the guilt on Calvary. It's gone if we're sanctified, if we're living for God, that's gone. The compulsion, he's dealing with us. And as he deals with the compulsion, the desire to sin, and gets that out of us, he begins to deal with the effects. As he says, I would that you be in health and prosper as your soul prospers. So many times there's a, there's a relationship to that. Not always, but many times it's so. And as God begins to get and dig at some of the things and clean them out, he heals you when you're not even prayed for. It just happens that way. So he is where he's taken care of the guilt. Now he's working with the compulsion and with the effects. And what he wants us to do is to get back what we have been sowing and to get it now and get it taken care of now and get it straightened out so that when he comes, we will receive the sentence of rising to ever be with the Lord. See, that's a sentence. That's a sentence of the court. The court can set you free. The court can award you a million dollars. The court can throw you in the, in the clanger. Clanker. Clinger. Clinker. I know. Slammer. 
I knew I was, I could hear it in my ears, but I had the wrong one. All right, the slammer, that iron door, that clang, the trail's off. All right, the slammer. The judge can do what he wants to. And so if you do what God says and you go through this process, the judge is going to sentence you to rise from the dead and be ever with the Lord. That's your sentence. That's why I object so strenuously to this doctrine that, uh, can you picture it? After we rise and are changed and ascend to meet the Lord, then we're judged in the air. You see, that's cuckoo. Because how can he, how can Christ raise you from the dead, get, fill you with immortal life, raise you up into his presence, and then recompense you for the evil that you've done? See, it does not compute. So that first resurrection is for people who are in Christ, who have been through the machinery and are ready, they've been judged, and whatever lingering thing there is left, the Lord just disbands it. See, the Lord can do that. He can take sin out of you like that. And you may get that, that happen sometime in your life where you wrestle and wrestle with, with some besetting sin and bang, one day you wake up and it's gone. Some go instantly. You can be prayed for and the lust will come out of you, whatever. Other things will stick in there and hang in there and you're prayed for and nothing happens, nothing happens. And one day you wake up and it's gone. It's very dramatic. But the Lord could have done this when you were saved. He could have go froop like that, and every bit of evil spirit in you would be gone. He has a power. To do that. But that is a reward. The abolishing of your sinful nature is a reward. Now he he can't do that and make you a faith-filled, victorious saint. He can't do that. That can only be done as you bear your cross in faith. That process can only be done through a long period of interaction with the Lord. But for the removal of evil, that could be done like that. So what we're doing, we're showing our stuff before the Lord. We're laboring and, and you know, like Paul, we have to keep beating this body and beating it down and, and uh, not to get a reward, but simply if we don't, we go wrong and... We're doing all these things in faith. We can't see. We have to deny ourselves many things as the Lord leads us. But what is going on there? The Lord knows these enemies are still there and he could just blow on them and they'd be gone and we'd be walking around like St. Francis of Assisi without a care in the world. No sin. The Lord could do that anytime. But instead, he leaves those enemies there because it's the battle against them that forms character. See, he left, you read the first chapter of Judges, God left enemies in the land to prove Israel by war. That's what it says. He left them there to prove Israel by war. And God could come to you, he could just take out your carnal nature, root and branch. Bang, you could do that tonight, you wouldn't have any carnal nature left. You'd be pure of heart. You'd take it right out of you, pull it right out by the roots. But by leaving it there and having you gain the victory, he's he's producing a warrior saint. He's producing someone who has patience and shows determination and faith and the love of God and, and that their will is being strengthened. Their will to choose righteousness in spite of the fact that their body is screaming for this, that, and the other and the soul is screaming for this, that, and the other. And inside that will is going stronger and stronger saying, I will choose the Lord. In spite of all of this, I will choose the Lord. I will choose the Lord. And every time you do that, you strengthen yourself. Now, what you earn is this. When the Lord comes, your sentence will be to have whatever remains of your sin removed and you will be filled with righteousness. See, you receive what you have done. If you have practiced righteousness, what you're going to receive is righteousness. See, that's your reward, is to have the compulsion removed. The sin is already gone. There's no condemnation. But your reward will be... Now, some of the compulsion will go now. See, some of it, it isn't just way off in the millennium. This is taking place. This process is taking place now, right now in your life. You're already forgiven. And some of you may have already uh, had the, the healing effects of the consequences of sin. And some of you have already experienced the removal of certain compulsions. 
But it's, it's never complete, it seems, in this life. We never quite make it. That's reserved for the coup de grace. See, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is physical death. And so every other enemy has to be conquered first. That's why the idea of raising people that have never battled, never overcome the enemy, uh, is incorrect in, in uh, sequence. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. That means every other enemy has been uh, defeated. Worldliness, the love of sin, and self-centeredness have all been dealt with and overcome. The last enemy that shall be dealt with by the Lord is death. The last enemy. And so for the people that have been faithful and have labored against the tremendous problem which the flesh is, their reward, their sentence when the Lord comes is to don a white raiment of righteousness. And they're given that, and that's their reward. And then they'll be clothed upon with glory unimaginable and to be ever with the Lord. You don't take people in that position and then judge them for the good and evil that they've done. See, it's crazy. It makes no sense. No sense. So this holds true. And at first blush, it seems uh, that, well, we don't want that. But on the second hand, you see that you do because this is the process that the Lord has made of redemption. This is the process of redemption. It is to receive what you have done. And as God changes you, then you begin to do the kind of things that will bring on you the glory of God. You don't, never gain that glory by mercy, forgiveness, grace. What you get by mercy and forgiveness is, and grace is forgiveness, but it never applies at this point. This point is a, is a principle of cause and effect. If you do good, you receive good. If you do evil, you receive evil. And it's great. It's tremendous. I know in teaching school that one thing kids do not like is for somebody to get away with something. It rattles all the kids. What they want to see is swift, sure justice. And then you can see them all settle down in their seats and they're ready to learn because the bounds have been set. But if a new teacher comes in and they're loose and they're trying to get the kids to love them and they don't do that, the, the, the kids get all nervous and anxious about it. They don't like that. They want to know where... The limits are. That's one thing that's going wrong in our nation is the limits are being removed and people are out of control. It's like an engine with no governor on it. They're looking for limits and there are no limits. They keep being taken away and it drives people crazy. So, you, you, you know, you don't have to look around and say this one's getting right away with that or that one's getting away with that. Nobody's getting away with anything. You look at all these people aborting babies. You say, how oh, despicable, you know. You can't stand the thought. Every one of them will receive what they have done. No, no. Justice is perfect. And Christ came not to, not to change that, but to change us. So we do what is right. So we can reap what is right. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. Paul feared God, and that's healthy. If you don't fear God tonight, ask God to give you the fear and terror of the Lord. It's a healthy thing. We persuade men, but we are made manifest to God. And I hope that we are made manifest also in your consciences. What he's talking about the fact. Now, we, we said that one of the things we were going to be bringing in was why the law of Moses is not relevant. Now, Paul always had this in his mind. He was fighting against people who were bringing the law, the external, that you could see into uh, the Christian doctrine and, and so that they had Christ as Savior, but they also had the Sabbath day and they also had circumcision. They also had dietary laws and in some cases kept the feast days. So they had these things that they were doing. They, they obeyed the kosher laws and they were bringing them in. And Paul was all the time trying to show that you, that that the Christianity is so different that it has to be manifest in the conscience. Not in what you're doing outside, but your relationship to God. Not religious practice like the Sabbath day. You remember how it's so ridiculous in Paul, uh, the Jews were running around trying to find out whether Timothy was circumcised. It's just uh, circumcised. 
reminds you of uh, Pentecostal people saying, well, does Billy Graham speak in tongues? Everybody ever heard him speak in tongues? We, we got that same kind of thing. We're looking for the external. But God is much more interested in the heart. Uh, you know, C.S. Lewis, and I admire him greatly, he had a way of, um, his, his writings are holy, and he had a tremendous, astonishing insight into the things of God, and he was a man of absolute perfect integrity. You can tell from his writing. You also know from his personal life, because he spent most of his adult life, most of it, taking care of a very, uh, what shall I say, uh, snappy lady, uh, who every day with this lady was a domestic crisis. She was one of those, every day. And he put up with this and took care of her and her daughter because uh, C.S. Lewis had a friend in the war, and the, before the friend died, the friend was killed in the war, he said, before he died, uh, he promised, he said, I'll take care of your mother. He took care of the guy's mother uh, years and years and years until she, until she died. He, she was institutionalized finally, and he kept going to the institution. He's a man of absolute integrity. He didn't get married until he was about 61, and it was after she died. And then he got married. He was married for three years, but he spent his whole adult life taking care of this irascible lady. Very snappish, very full of domestic. Everything was, every day was a domestic crisis. As she took her dog out for a walk. It, 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 people like that. They make a crisis where there is no crisis. And he put this up and it was all heaped on top of his head and that's the way he lived. Just because he promised a friend in the war when he was a young man, he'd take care of his mother. So he's a man of absolute integrity. His Christianity was astonishing in every way you look at it. He came to the Lord after wrestling. He was a famous agnostic, and then he came to the Lord and became what, what were they call the apostle to the agnostics. And, and many people, you know, uh, Charles Coulson, uh, that does the Princeton work now, was saved by reading C.S. Lewis stuff. And multitudes of people have been saved. But this man smoked and drank. And he thought anybody that, any teetotaler was just crazy. He had his pipe, and he had his port, and uh, he, he wasn't a drunkard. He just thought that anybody that didn't drink was crazy. And you see, we would run around and say, oh, you know, there it is. But uh, God doesn't judge that. Now, if you go out and smoke and drink, your blood's on your own head. That's, that, that's not what I'm talking I know they say Spurgeon smoked cigars. Well, I'm sure he did. But that isn't, that isn't where it is with God. Now, I say that, I suppose, in jeopardy. I suppose I'll cause somebody to stumble. But that is not where it is with God. Now, we don't, we don't drink because we know it defiles the temple of, of God. Now, he may not have known of the physiology of alcohol. And smoking is certainly one of the most destructive things that ever was to your health. And, but that data has come in since Lewis' time. And it's in America, in any case, alcohol and cigarettes are out because we're crazy. We Americans are crazy. We can't drink like Europeans. I mean, if we're going to drink, we drink till we're slopped and driving a car and killing three people. But uh, so as far as uh, our temperament in America, no booze, no cigarettes. But the point that I'm making is, this is not where it is. It's in the conscience. It's in what you've got going with God. This is where Christianity is. It's what you've got going with God. Now, of course, he judges our deeds. But they come. Your deeds, of course, come from where your conscience is. We are not, again, commending ourselves to you but are giving you an occasion to be proud of us because he was getting this all the time from the Judaizers. They were saying this, Paul is nowhere. He's a reprobate Jew. He doesn't even keep the Sabbath day. He does, doesn't do all these things. And he's saying, we, I want you to be proud of us because we're, our hearts are right in the sight of God. And he keeps coming out with this idea, you see it in a minute, that, uh, of what the Christianity really is. He says, but you may have an answer for those who take pride in appearance. Now, Judaism is a law that can easily go to appearance. And that's what the Pharisees did, didn't they? They made broad what? Remember? 
Phylacteries, the things that you tie on you, they have the law written them. You tie them around your forehead and tie them around your arm. They have a little leather packet and then the laws in there, the Ten Commandments. And it lends, Judaism lends itself because it's external practice. When you come into Christianity, you don't have that to show anybody. So a Jew can come along and say, well, you know, I can show you my phylacteries. I can show you that I keep the Sabbath. I can show you that I eat kosher meat. And I say, well, kosher meat means nothing to me. Uh, phylacteries mean nothing to me. Well, we, uh, these, what do you call these little things? Uh, mezuzah, that, yeah, that's Yiddish, isn't it? Mezuzah that you put on your uh, door. Well, we have one on the office at home. Make sure our office is kosher. But, but that, is, uh, that is the external. The end. For a Jew like Paul to be able to make the whole transition. But what he saw, we'll see in a minute, uh, why he was able to do it. He said, but those who take pride in appearance, but not in their heart. Their hearts are wrong. That's what Jesus said. But they keep all this stuff going where people can see. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God, living unto God, rejoicing before God, dancing where people can't see us unto God. And if we are of a sound mind, it is for you. So Paul says, after I get through with my wild gyrations, I settle down and I do stuff for your sake. I live for you. Uh, you get, we used to have that in Pentecost, that people have their private devotions in church, and that was tremendous because nobody else could do anything while somebody went through their number. You know, but we, we don't seem to have that problem here, but it used to be. And uh, you couldn't do it. Somebody come in and boy, until they had gone through their personal devotion, they didn't care about anybody else just having their ding-dong thing. Uh, we don't do that here. All right. For the love of Christ controls us Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore, all died. Now, what's he talking about? You've got to remember, we started off in the fourth chapter where he's talking about, I'm cast down, I'm persecuted. Where is this guy coming from? He's explaining the heart of, of the New Testament. And I wrote a little thing here. That uh, to get my brain straight, but see if this makes any sense to you. I told you, I promised you that I would show you why all this we've been teaching showed why the law of Moses is not relevant. Now, this is a live issue. I had a man call me uh, just the other day uh, that's been attending a Messianic congregation. This man's been attending a very wonderful, fine Christian man attending a Messianic congregation. And he says, I had to quit. Because they are telling us we have to keep the law. And then we were told by someone who left this church uh, that is in Israel now that the Jewish Christians are having a problem with that. I mean, it's not a dead issue. It's very hard to see. And once you ever get into Seventh-day Adventism and start keeping the Sabbath day, that may stay with you the rest of your life. You'll always be nervous about working on Saturday. Even though you're in a church that doesn't observe this, there's something about it that grips your faith. And you see, whatever is not of faith is sin. If you're raised in a home where they don't eat pork, for example, and there's Christians who do not eat pork, you'll have a hard time the rest of your life. Every time you eat pork, you'll, you'll feel that. Because, because there's been no real explanation forthcoming on why we don't keep the law. The preachers say, oh, because the law is done away and now we're under grace. And then if you say to them, what do you mean by that? Well, it means we don't have to keep the law. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, we're saved by grace. That means that whatever we do, God forgives us. That's not satisfying for the person who is really conscientious. They say, then oh, they'll always say then, if that's the case, then uh, what do we do about adultery? Because the law speaks against adultery. Well, we can't keep a, do adultery. Well, why not? No answer, because it's not theoretically sound. And so that's why people are never sure, you know, should I eat pork? You know, what God said, you don't do it, and here I am doing it. And you could see the confusion in the prosperity message. They were saying that if you have faith, you'll be blessed like Abraham, mixing the two covenants. But that's where the Christian church is today, and that's the problem. And there's an answer here, and it's clear to me. See if it's clear to you. It has to do with the goal and the method of the law as compared to the goal and the method of the new covenant. <laughs> it's not all that hard to understand. The goal of the law, the goal of the law is very simple. This would be on the tape. It's, it's to keep your animal nature in check 
so God may accept you and bless you in this life. Let me go through that again. The, pur the purpose of the law, and I mean by that the Ten Commandments, which is usually referred to as the law, but also the statutes and ordinances and the animal sacrifices and everything, is to keep your animal nature in check so God may accept you and bless you in this life. There's no thrust in the Old Testament, to my knowledge, about, or very little, that you keep the law so that you'll have a better resurrection. The thrust it seems to be that if when you do right, God blesses your land, he blesses your store, bless shalt thou be in the store, bless shalt thou be in the basket, uh, you go against your enemy one way, and they'll flee against you seven ways, and God will... Uh, uh, send uh, the clouds of refreshing. Conversely, if you break the law of God, then your heaven becomes brass, your enemy comes against you one way, and you flee seven ways, and it's all, the promises are not heavenly in the Old Testament. They are not. To keep your animal nature in check so God may accept you and bless you in this life. Now, it may be that the Talmud uh, emphasizes heaven. But I don't see it in the Old Testament scriptures. It talks about uh, prosperity, food, clothing, shelter, agricultural success, protection from your enemies, protection from animals, protection from disease. I will put none of these diseases upon you. And then he talks about that if you're evil, the animals will come in and so on. And you can read in the last few chapters of Deuteronomy uh, the blessings that were on Mount Gerizim, and the curse that was on Mount Ebal. And you can read those in the last few chapters of Deuteronomy. And, and the blessing was for those who keep this word. If you keep this word, this is what will happen. It's all, there's nothing about when you die, you'll go to heaven. It's all about your enemies, physical prosperity, your well-being in this world. If you do evil, the, the reverse is true, uh, you, you, you go down. And that's what happened to Israel. When they disobeyed God, their enemies came and they fled and, and the heavens became brass and they had drought and they uh, had tremendous famines, tremendous famines, uh, periodically because of their wickedness. So the goal of the law was to keep your animal nature in check so God may accept you and bless you in this life. Does that make sense to you? Read it and I think you'll find out that was true. All right, the method of the law, the method that it used was to furnish you with moral guidelines and animal sacrifices to cleanse away your guilt so you would have a good conscience toward God, so you could have fellowship with God. It gave you the moral guidelines, the written guidelines, that was its method of keeping you in check, and it furnished a system of sacrifices so that after you had sinned, you could be restored in fellowship to God. Okay? All right, that's the law. Now, that is the law. Now, when you get to the New Covenant, it is totally different. And that's why you cannot mix the two, because it has nothing to do with eating pork, the Sabbath day, or anything else. It holds your moral nature in check. But listen to this. The, the, the goal of the New Testament, you'll see the, uh, the uh, New Covenant, you see the difference instantly, is to create a new inward nature in you to redeem your body, to clothe you with glory, to make you the eternal habitation of God, God's eternal servant. You see the difference? Let's go back. The goal of the law was to keep your animal nature in check so God may accept you and bless you in this life. Told you how to live. But the new covenant, is its purpose is to create a new inward nature. When it does that, to redeem your body, to clothe you with glory, to make you the eternal habitation of God and God's eternal servant. So the goals are so different as to not even be comparable. One just affects the Adamic nature and keeps him in check so that God can receive him and bless him. The other one goes to the individual and says, I'm going to change what you are. No comparison. Now the method of the new covenant includes primarily death and resurrection. That's how God deals with us under the new covenant 
is by continually dying and continually living. It includes, the method includes the things portrayed by the seven feasts, beginning with the Passover blood, going through water baptism, going through the born-again experience, going through the baptism with the Holy Spirit, going through with the divine judgment that we experience, and finishing up with the coming of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to dwell in us. You see, it is death and resurrection. So as we've been studying death and resurrection, that is the nature of the new covenant. There is no mention of such a thing under the old covenant. No mention of death and resurrection. Never was it said to any of the patriarchs, you have to present your body a living sacrifice or take up your cross and follow me. It was slanted to this world, to, uh, to uh, happiness, material happiness. And that's why when the prosperity teachers talk about the Abrahamic blessing, they're talking through their hat. That is not the goal of our covenant. So you can see the, the method of the law is to furnish you with moral guidelines. One of those guidelines is do not commit adultery. Another one of those guidelines is you do not eat pork so that you can learn to distinguish between clean and unclean so that you get the thing in your mind uh, that this is clean and this is unclean and worship God in that distinction. But see, then that was changed and the sheet let down to Peter. See, what God has called uh, clean, do not call unclean or common. See, God changed that. So, it, so if the method of the new covenant is death and resurrection, the seventh feast, he's given us the scriptures, the testimony of the apostles, and then the ministries of the Holy Ghost, the gifts of the Spirit, and all these things, none of which were true under the old covenant except for the scripture, that if you take and try to bring into the new covenant the Sabbath day, it is completely irrelevant because the purpose of the Sabbath day was to hold the animal nature in check so it'd be accepted to God and be blessed in this life. So what is it going to do to the new covenant? It gets our eyes off this intense interaction between our conscience and God's, which God is after. So we, we're realizing that our conscience is pure, we're vigorously interacting. We're beside ourselves unto God. We, we calm down so that people can understand what we're talking about and be edified. It has nothing to do with the Sabbath day. It has nothing to do with pork. It has, because that's all just to keep the natural man in check. And, and Jesus, under this covenant, keeps it in check by what? Huh? Yes, that's a positive part. That's, that's certainly, definitely it. And that is a way... Writing the law in our hearts is another way of saying that Christ is for us, because Christ is the Word. So it isn't a writing like of the Ten Commandments. It's a, it's a death to, the, to our heart, to our inward motivation, that God brings about as we are frustrated, as we are perplexed, as we are as a, a cause to continue in situations we don't like. That causes in your heart a change if you take it right and don't blame people. Again, let me say, things are going to happen to you that are going to surprise you. I mean, you're probably all geared up to expect certain kinds of problems. The problems that are going to happen to you are going to be so different and come out from a direction that you do not anticipate that your instinct will be, well, I know Brother Thomas talks about problems, but he didn't mean this. Don't laugh too soon. He didn't mean this. And your temptation will be to blame people and circumstances. Because if the trial came that you had expected, you would, you would not do that. You'd say, well, this is something from the hand of God to write the law in my heart. But because it comes from a direction that it takes you totally off guard, you begin to look out whose fault is it? Whose fault? Now remember that, it's going to be very important to you. Just don't be surprised at anything. And it's not going to be horrid and, and terrible and destructive. What it's going to do is it's, going, it's tailor-made. The thing that is coming to you is tailor-made, tailor-made uniquely for you to get at those areas of your life that are bondage, that are bondage, that are keeping you from being the free person in Jesus, the selfless, 
ministering, loving person that God wants you to be with a proper compassion and outreach to people. And God wants to make you a door, you know. Uh, the, the doors to the, to the New Jerusalem are pearls, and you know how pearls are made. And God is making pearls. He's making people that in, in their heart are the highways to Zion so that, you know, they pass through the valley of Baca of weeping and, and they turn it into a well of refreshing. Well, those people are in their heart are the highways to Zion, the place to the festivals of God, but you don't form such people easily. But when you're around them and you come for help, Instead of getting a lot of fleshly advice, what you get is a trip to Zion. See, they take you to Zion. And that's what God wants to make us. But we have in us these bondages that we can no more deal with them than anything. We don't know what they are. We don't see ourselves as other people see us. Much less how God sees us. And so all we can do is keep this conscience thing, keep interacting. And it, see, that's where the Sabbath day, circumcision, all this, interfere. Because they get your mind on the external, which is, as Paul says, it's, he says, circumcision it's, or uncircumcision has nothing to do with it. It's a new creature in Galatians 6. So it just gets you sidetracked. But if you get concentrating on uh, the issues of the day and the things that are causing you pain and worry, sufficient unto the day is the evil, not the good, the evil. And every day has its allotment of evil. <laughs> did, did you find that to be true today? Yeah, I think you did. All right. Now, as you pray and interact and keep a good conscience toward God, do not blame people. Do not become angry and discontent with God, impatient with God. You keep, that's where you overcome by the word of your testimony, by not attributing to God ignorance of your plight or unfaithfulness in keeping you. That's where people mess up. They don't give God the glory, but we overcome by giving God the glory in these, in these uh, things that irritate us and keep interacting like that. You get your mind off everything except you're living for Jesus and abiding in him. And these things are just like a carburetor. They just make it possible for the engine to go. They just work for you and give you the very ignition that you need. And that keeps you changing, dying, living, dying, living. And every time you live, it's, line upon line and precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, that you might go and be uh, and uh, fall backward. You go and then you fall backward and you're broken and snared and taken. And it's line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, and there a little. And that's, that's how the new covenant works. So if you try to stick on it some external thing, it isn't that there's anything wrong with keeping the Sabbath day or, or keeping the kosher. Well, there's nothing wrong with it, except it's, it's, um, it detracts from what God is doing. It's going back to another game. It's a game played by different rules. And it's like being, you're playing football, and then you try to bring in some of the rules of baseball. I mean, it just, it's, it's a different ball game. Now, do you understand that? The one is a set of guidelines to keep your animal nature in check. The other one is a divine program of death and resurrection. Now, not every Christian understands that, so if you do, <laughs> you kind of have a leg up on the situation. All right, now, let's see if this fits what Paul says here, because this is always in his mind. Because remember, he was the only one that God gave this understanding. He was the only one. You will not find this in Peter. Peter does mention being born again, not of incorruptible seed. But as far as this process and comparing it to Moses, Peter and Paul didn't get along. James talks about different things, keeping God's commandments. Uh, uh, John, I mean, James talks about practical church life. And Jude is rebuking the carnal. But Paul, Paul alone, had that understanding, and it's a subtle one. People still don't understand it, seems. Uh, that one died for all, therefore all died, and he died for all, that they who live should no longer live for themselves. Ready? See how the prosperity message was going exactly counter to God? 
no longer live for themselves. Going absolutely counter to God by stressing to the person, you can be rich. You can have health. You can have power. You, so it's the opposite, should no longer live unto themselves. But for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Now, if you live for Jesus and not for yourself, you're a perfect Christian. You've made the whole thing. There's no more than that. There is no more than that. And all the rest of the exhortation and the experiences and everything else are scaffolding. That's all there is, is to live unto Jesus. There is no more than that. There is no higher place than that. That and everything else comes under that and is just scaffolding. And you say, if it's so simple, then why do we have all this other stuff? Because of our evil disposition and because of Satan, make it complicated. But the end is only to live to Jesus. That's, now, does that seem too simple for you? Usually it sounds too simple for us because we're not in the rest of God and we're not convinced that God knows what he's doing. But when we get broken and snared and taken and knocked down enough times and get tired enough, we're glad that it's that simple. It's just living unto Jesus and not unto ourselves. And if we didn't love the world, sin, and our own self-will, we'd have no problem with it. <laughs> okay. Now, therefore, all right, therefore, from now on, because of this, because of the judgment seat of Christ, because an excellent weight of glory is being laid up for us, because we are living by death and resurrection and have died and are raised up in him, because this is true, we recognize no man according to the flesh. We're not concerned with what people were or their animal nature. We're looking for the new person. If you've known a real Christian over a number of years, you can see the tremendous transformation. Many Christians do not grow. The Christian church is constructed so that people will not grow. It, it, it keeps them in an eternal babyhood. You can be 50 years in a church and not grow an inch. And many of you probably have known church people that you've met after 20, 30 years and they haven't grown at all. Have any of you had that experience? There's some dynamic that is missing in the Christian church that prevents people from growing, or at least it doesn't catalyze their growth. It just keeps them an infant, and they grow old, and they're no different. Uh, Fifty years after the time they were saved, they don't know the Bible. They still have a churlish disposition. If they were <coughs> violent 50 years ago, they're still violent. If they were a certain type of person, they're still a certain type of person. It's amazing. There's something that makes the difference. And you'll see other people that are just growing. You see them from year to year, and there's just a whole new person coming to life. So we don't know anyone after the flesh. We don't look back. We don't, we're not nostalgic. I hope you're not nostalgic. It's a sickness of the soul, and it causes you to weep about things that never were. But we love to do that in a maudlin fashion, and it's a damnic. I don't guess it's any great sin, but it certainly uh, it doesn't cause heaven to, to resonate with joy, I'll tell you that. Because, see, God, God's whole redemption, everything is slanted toward the future. The past is done away. It's scaffolding. It's an example. It's to get us to today. Now, what we're looking at is a whole new world. We ha we, we've known people after the flesh. We know them no more. Everything that is good and desirable is ahead of us because the scripture says, no good thing will he withhold from them who walk uprightly. You want to get an upward look, <coughs> have someone die that you really love. Then you can begin to picture the life above and that pulls you up. But even when you meet that person, that person will be new because God is not saving what we are. He's making a new creature, a new creation. Now at Christmas time, we go back and we talk about the Christ that was, but he isn't that anymore. He isn't what he was in Bethlehem anymore. He's been raised from the dead. 
He's been born again from the dead in that sense. So he says, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, he's probably given Peter and James and John a little dig there. Because Paul didn't know him after the flesh, but they did. Even though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. That's why you can't touch it with the law. Because God is after a new inward man. And God is works with us and we are darkness and light, and God is separating the light from the darkness in us. He always separates the light from the darkness. In, uh, in the physical realm, you can't have darkness and light in the same place. In the spiritual realm, you can. You can have darkness and light in the same place. There is darkness and light in, in all of us here. And God is separating the light from the darkness. It doesn't separate the darkness from the light. It separates the light from the darkness. So he is working on you, developing your inward nature, your animal nature. Uh, God leaves. It's a husk. It's a husk. Your animal nature is a husk. And husks are important. A husk in nature is important. It serves a very necessary purpose. You don't eat husks. Hogs eat them. But we don't eat the husks of things. You don't take an ear of corn and eat it, you know, with all the husk on it. I don't think you do, do you? Maybe when you were a kid, you got behind the barn and smoked it. I don't know. <laughs> I guess you weren't raised on a farm, so you know what it's like to smoke corn husks like that. But anyway, uh, you could do that, but you don't eat it. But husks are very important in nature. And hus are important in us. And we like to think that we're real pure spirits floating around. And we're not. We're basically very animal. But there is being developed light in us. And that light is Jesus. And coming up, and, and it's getting into all parts of our nature and, evident, and eventually will into our body. But the basic animal soulish nature is held in check and used by God. It's used by God. Our basic animal nature is used by God until it's not necessary anymore. And then God just draws forth that beautiful, shining creature, clothes it with glory. And that is a new creation. You see, uh, there is a rule that God told them, you cannot enter into the land. You have to go City by city. Do you remember why he said so? He said you can't take it all at once. Exactly. You see, you had in there Philistines, and they had the farms under control, and they had the wild animals, of which there were many in Old Testament times, wolves and bears, lions, indigenous to that area and they were under they were kept under control by the natives and so what those Philistines were doing was holding the land until the light the law would come the, the ark of the testimony which means the ark of the ten commandments the light of God his law would come into that darkness but you see in the meanwhile the Philistines were keeping the land that's what God said lest the beast of the field increase on you See, they were keeping that land perfect. So they would just take one city. In the meanwhile, the Philistines are keeping all the rest of the land. Now, <laughs> if God had, had uh, you know, in one of those battles, God sent down hailstones. There was more killed with the hailstones than there were with the Israelite swords. Now, God could have killed all the Philistines at once with hailstones because they're kept against the day of battle, you know, hailstones are. Well, he said, I'm not going to do that because the, by the time the Israelites got in there, it would have been a shambles. They weren't able to occupy it that fast. They were not able to do it. They weren't organized to do that. These people were raised in the wilderness, and they were not organized to do that. So God says, I'll give you a clip it off a little bit at a time. And that's what he's doing with us. But you want to remember that that means that a great part of our personality is being held by Philistines. It's being held by the enemies of the Lord. Right? 
And the fear of God is on them, just like the fear of God was on Jericho and the fear of God was on these other countries. The fear of God is on them. Don't let them bluff you. They know their end is, is coming. And they can see what God is doing in your personality, but there's nothing they can do about it. But God is using them to hold you before him because your, your natural stubbornness and your other various lusts and drives keep you intact as a person. Now, you have to keep them under control for sure, but they do manage to get people to the mission field and to keep going and things and to keep life going and to keep kids coming on the way. If we were just pure spirits, these kind of things wouldn't interest us. And we wouldn't be able to hold anything. We'd be the biggest bunch of ding-dongs that ever were. And that's what happens to spiritual people when they get ascetics. They get to be ascetics. You know, and they get chased. And I remember in the beginning of the Latter Rain movement, they preached celibacy. You know, all the sons of God were eunuchs. And this will this popped up in the Shaker, uh, in the Shaker uh, cult, for example. That's why they died out, because uh, <laughs> they died out. That's right. That's right. They died out. That was a large movement at one time. And their recipes for food are with us to this day. But naturally, and as to be expected, they died out. And that is not what God wants. He wants, he wants stable people that are people, that are not ascetics. They do not try to gain points by abusing themselves. You know, that doesn't, that, that develops spiritual pride is what that does. But they interact in this conscience thing with God, being made manifest in people's conscience that they are living unto God. And if God put some part of their life in checkmate, and he says that, that you know, you don't do that anymore. Okay, but they don't do that because they're trying to be more righteous. They do that because God is doing that in order to bring them along some path to give them victory. And so the commander-in-chief is doing all the battles. The commander-in-chief is keeping everything going, and we're not trying to add to it with any kind of religion. What we're doing is living unto Jesus. We... He died for us, so we count ourselves dead. So we're living unto him. So he's bringing us unto all these uh, situations which seem like disasters. But when we look back on them, we wondered what we worried about because God brought them all through. Isn't that true in your life? The things you dreaded and, and God took care of them all. But the one you're facing now, you think, oh, this, but he did all those others. But this one is a real problem here. And that's the way we go from disaster to disaster. And God keep bailing us out. But... What God is doing is changing us. And he's leaving us intact. Don't we wish that we could walk two feet off the floor? Don't we wish that there was no animal nature there? And we're so sweet. And we pray so lovelily. It's just really just so sweet you can hardly stand it. But you let somebody cross us. And that animal nature comes out like a wounded bear. And I mean, we are ready to fight. And then we're, all of our spirituality goes out the window. Now, we may justify it and say we have righteous indignation. But the truth is the wrath of man works not the righteousness of God. And the truth is we just plain blew it. We didn't keep that wounded bear in check there. But God doesn't. Take him out. He leaves him there, but he begins to pull out the light. And over the years, you get it. You still have the human nature, but you've got it under control. And by wisdom and and the spirit of the Lord, you learn how to make the moves and not to lead yourself into temptation. Get yourself out of temptation. Make it's a long, perilous, treacherous journey. But if we do it, then our reward when the Lord comes is a white raiment. See, because in Revelation 19 it says. So the bride was given white raiment, and it says the white raiment is the righteousnesses, not righteousness, as in the King James. It's a proper translation. It's the righteousnesses of the saints. We're going to be clothed in our own deeds of righteousness. And the Lord will take the animal nature, and since the, uh, the blood will be gone out of the body, there's no need for it. But by that time, there's so much of the other, the Lord has good, solid, new creatures. And he did it beautifully. But during the process, we must remember we're still in an animal nature. And God deals with it. God's wrath is not on the animal nature. He's not saying shame, 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 shame. 
That's asceticism, and it has no place in Christianity. We're, we recognize what we are. We have a sense of humor about what we are, uh, a right attitude toward other people in the world. We don't think we're God's gift to the creation or some pink puffball that's floating around. We recognize we're just people with a good thing going. And brothers and sisters, that is an important thing in the Christian life to keep you from fanaticism. To realize that you're just uh, an ordinary person and not some religious super duper person, but you're an ordinary person that God is dealing with to separate the light from the darkness. But the darkness is still there, but God has it in check while he's strengthening this new man. Does that make sense to you? And therefore, if any man be in Christ, that's the expression in the rapture. See, the dead in Christ. If any man is in Christ, as opposed from walking in the flesh, he is a new creation. All things, the all things, passed away. And that's our Adamic nature. It doesn't say sin passed away, just, oh, the whole old thing is passing away. The, the scaffolding. Behold, new things have come. Now, all these things are from God. These things that are happening to, to us are from God. They have to do with the judgments. They have to do with the life of Christ showing forth in us. They have to do with this weight of glory being laid up. They have to do the fact that we're dying daily and being raised up daily, going down to death and then coming up in life, line upon line, precept upon precept, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely, <coughs> that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were entreating you through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, not, not do the four steps of salvation, but be reconciled. Be reconciled. You have to interpret that. See, this is one of these that's taken out of context. You have to, you have to uh, interpret this from what's been said before. And he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Not imputed righteousness, but the righteousness that comes as through Christ we sow right things and we begin to receive right things and become a new creation. When the, the thing that is reconciled is our nature is reconciled not by being forgiven, but by being transformed. You see that? You have to keep it in context because those verses have been taken, 20 and 21 have been taken way out of context, applied to the sinner. They have nothing to do with the sinner and they just mean do the four steps of salvation and you're reconciled. How many know that after you first did the four steps of salvation, there's still a lot of party that was not reconciled to God. So we keep beseeching people, be reconciled. Shall we stand?